All right. Dear members of Dr. Watson's neglected patients and esteemed guests, welcome to the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Dr. Watson's neglected patients, the Denver Area Scion Society. This afternoon, we have a very special lineup of guests sharing their Sherlockian research, as well as remembering some of the illustrious members in our group's history, uh, which I'll talk about in a second here. It started in the year 1974. Librarian and author Mary Ake, as well as her friend Nancy Wynn, decided to form a Denver area Sherlock Holmes Society. They were rightfully unhappy with the BSI because at that time they excluded women from membership. And they wanted to form a society welcoming to all. They put a notice in the local newspapers to have an initial meeting at the Bemis Library in Littleton, Colorado on a Wednesday evening. When I interviewed Mary Ake back in 2014, uh, she explained to me, and this is a quote, she said, I expected 35 people to show up that night. Instead, 250 people showed up in the meeting room, which surprised me. Uh, and at times she's actually said between 150 and 250. So that, that number is goes up and down occasionally. <laughs> That evening, the crowd was treated to a talk by the great Ron DeWall, author of the Sherlockian masterpiece, The World Bibliography of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. He spoke about his recent trip to England and shared some of the Sherlockian locales he visited. The meeting wrapped up with the attendees taking the doctor's oath. Okay, We had the oath, Mary told me, and I was awed that everyone took it that night. So the oath is something that is unique to Dr. Watson's Neglected Patients, and I will read it to you just so you can hear it. I won't make everybody read it because not everyone's a member, but it goes, I hereby affirm that Sherlock Holmes is the master detective as has been revealed to us in the sacred writings of Dr. John H. Watson, MD, and that we always toast at our annual dinners. Okay. <laughs> Thus it was on September 11th, 1974, that Dr. Watson's Neglected Patients was formed. Over the years, the group has had some fun events, including participation in cricket matches, plays, talks, tours of the CSI, and viewing of Bartitsu demonstrations, just to name a few. We've had birthday dinner celebrations for both Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, annual spring teas at the Denver Women's Press Club, and occasional get-togethers with Peter Blah and his group, the practical but limited geologists. Some members even gave talks and presentations as part of the international exhibit of Sherlock Holmes when it traveled to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. One highlight of the group is our monthly get togethers, the outpatients, a separate subset of DWNP, where we meet uh, to drink, have lunch and discuss a story from the original Sherlock Holmes canon. We meet at Pints Pub in Denver and climb 17 steps to our meeting area where we take a quiz. And as I said, discuss a story from the canon. Whether you are a Colorado resident or someone tuning into today's celebration from abroad, if you are ever in the Denver area, all are welcome to join us. I'm just gonna pause for a second to let a couple more people into the meeting. I wanna end my introduction by letting everyone know that Dr. Watson's Neglected Patients is a 501c3 organization. Any donation to the group is tax deductible. Dues are just $10 a year for contributing members, and if you feel generous, $50 a year for supporting members. Please consider donating to the group and helping us to continue our mission of spreading the sacred Sherlockian writings to the world. Now let us get to the main program of the evening. Our first talk is from esteemed DWNP member Eric Skase. Eric has been an active Sherlockian since he was the secretary of Cornell University Scion, the Baker Street Underground, from 1972 to 1975. He's a member of the Speckled Band of Boston, the Irene Adler Society, and Dr. Watson's Neglected Patients in Denver. In 2023, Eric was awarded the Morley Montgomery Award for his BSJ article, five quarter centuries of confusion over the missing three quarter. Recently at the Sherlock at 50 conference by the Norwegian 
explorers at the University of Minnesota, Eric also presented. Let's give a virtual warm welcome to Eric Skase. And I will change, thank you, thank you all. And let me change to go to gallery for a sec. Just gonna mute a few other people. Make sure Eric is unmuted. Ah, and Eric has started screen sharing, excellent. I'm gonna shut myself up and let Eric take over. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Derek, and thank you to modern technology. <laughs> uh, so um, I'll try and keep an eye on comments and questions in the chat, um, probably at the end here. Um, but uh, let us begin. Dr. Watson left us some tantalizing hints to a lot of important activities uh, that occur in the shadows of Holmes's adventures. And these are shadows that we can illuminate even at this late, simple, uh, late date simply by applying knowledge of the history and technology of that era. So in looking at this title slide, your first question may be, what's a cablegram? And that is simply a telegram that was sent via an underseas cable. So now uh, let's just Pick an adventure. Uh, we'll use uh, a half page of text from the epilogue in the Valley of Fear uh, to illustrate how to uncover some of these hidden mysteries. Um, and that text begins, uh, let's see, as follows. Two months had gone by and the case to some extent had passed from our minds. Then one morning came an enigmatic note slipped into our letterbox. And please pay attention to the items in blue here. Dear me, Mr. Holmes, dear me, said the singular epistle. There was neither superscription nor signature. I laughed at the quaint message, but Holmes showed unwanted seriousness. Deviltry, Watson, he remarked, and he sat long with a clouded brow. Late last night, Mrs. Hudson, our landlady, brought a message that a gentleman wished to see Holmes and that the matter was of the utmost importance. Close at the heels of his messenger came Cecil Barker, our friend of the moated manor house. His face was drawn and haggard. I have had bad news, terrible news, Mr. Holmes, said he. I feared as much, said Holmes. You have not had a cable, have you? I have had a note from someone who has. It's poor Douglas. They tell me his name is Edwards, but he will always be Jack Douglas of Benito Canyon to me. I told you that they started together for South Africa in the Palmyra three weeks ago. Exactly. The ship reached Cape Town last night. I received this cable from Mrs. Douglas this morning. Jack has been lost overboard in a gale off St. Helena. No one knows how the accident occurred. Ivy Douglas. Ha, it came like that, did it? Said Holmes thoughtfully. Well, I have no doubt it was well stage managed. You mean you think that there was no accident? None in the world. He was murdered? Surely. Okay, so probably your head hurts like mine did when I started looking into this because we have all these names and dates uh, buried in this short section of text. So let's start taking a look at some of them and we'll start here in the upper left corner to untangle this mess. So two months had gone by, but two months from when? And fortunately, in the very opening scene of Valley of Fear, while deciphering the coded message from Porlock, Holmes actually gives us a date, the 7th of January. So two months later, we now know that we are looking at early March. But as to the year, well, we need to know the year to understand where we are in telegraph history. Most citations in uh, Les Klinger's annotated say that the year is 1888, but there's a sprinkling of 87s, 89s, 1890s, and even a 1900. Uh, we'll refine amongst these choices as we go along by looking at other information. For example, let's consider the Palmyra in this statement three weeks ago. So three weeks ago in mid-February, the Palmyra departed. Uh, this is a picture of the Palmyra. It's a ship that used both sails and steam, was the length of a football field, and had a width of about 38 feet. It was initially used to carry immigrants to Boston and New York, and it delivered almost 11,000 uh, immigrants to Boston alone. Now, after a retrofit of the steam propulsion system at the Admiralty's expense, the Palmyra was used intermittently for troop transport over the next few years. And in 1879, she made her first recorded voyage to South Africa 
during the Anglo-Zulu War, carrying troops. Thereafter followed 11 years, primarily on Cunard's Liverpool Mediterranean route, with occasionally going to other destinations in the Atlantic. She was retired from service in 1891 and scrapped six years later. And since she was scrapped in 1891, we know that Doug the Douglases traveled to South Africa on or before 1891, and we can drop this date of 1900 from further consideration. Now, why did they sail to South Africa? To understand why the Douglases left for South Africa, we need to understand some things about the Nido Canyon. So southeast of San Jose, California stands the Diablo mountain range, and within that is San Benito Mountain. Mercury mining began here in 1854. In fact, over 17,000 tons of mercury were extracted over the next 120 years from San Benito Mountain, and that's enough to fill and destroy two Olympic-sized swimming pools. These, condition, uh, these locations are now Superfund cleanup sites, and a half century after their closure, these mines still continue to leak mercury into the adjacent creeks. But when Jack Douglas and Cecil Barker were working in this area, mercury was essential to the extraction of gold from ore, and their fortunes came from the production and sale of mercury to those who were mining gold in California. But when were Jack and Cecil in California? Well, in order to figure that out, we need to back out to a more comprehensive look at the events in this story that led to the murder in Burlstone. So I put a small question mark here by 1888 events at Burlstone Manor, just to remind us that we haven't quite settled yet whether these events occurred in 1887, 88, or 89. But in 1872, the text states that Bertie Edwards joins the Chicago Lodge and two and a half years later, as Jack McMurdo, he arrives in Vermissa Valley. And it was just three months later when Brother Morris shares his secret with McMurdo. Morris has received a letter on a Friday in May from a friend back east who is a telegraph operator. Now, we lack the time to develop an understanding of how the American system of public telegraphy is reflected in and informs our understanding of events in the canon, but we'll note just two points here. First, that the operator reveals that he has been handling a lot of telegrams from the Western Union office in Hobson's Patch for Missa Valley. He has committed a grave indiscretion by revealing even the existence of these messages. Anyone who works in a telegraph office is prohibited from revealing anything about messages or even that a message was sent or received. So Morris's friend put his livelihood entirely at risk in this letter. If it was discovered, not only would he be immediately fired, but he could never again hold a job in the telegraph field. And as to handling a queer cipher by the yard, the meaning of this odd expression will be revealed a little bit later. Now, during the arrests that occurred the following Sunday morning after Morse's revelations, uh, Bertie Edwards reinforces that the date is May, and then he leaves for Chicago with his future wife. At some point, Mr. and Mrs. Edwards flee Chicago to California because of these multiple attempts on his life. And we can ask ourselves who in Chicago might have made those attempts. And the answer uh, that fits in the timeline is, in fact, the most dangerous crook in Chicago. That would be Abe Slaney of the Patrick Gang of Chicago, who was identified by Detective Wilson Hargreave of the New York police in a cable to Holmes in a later story. Mrs. Edwards, now Douglas, dies in California. Douglas and Barker meet and they start mining mercury. And to make those dates a little bit more precise, we have to work backwards from the events at Burlston. We note that Jack Douglas may have been in England for some time before settling in Sussex. Cecil Barker tells Inspector McDonald that he and Douglas worked together in California for five years and came to England close to seven years ago. And while these relative times would still work if the murder at Burlstone occurred in 1889 or 1890, if it were in 1887, the timeline gets kind of unreasonably compressed. So um, although this seems like we've gone through a huge rabbit hole, the facts will actually make the Douglas's choice of South Africa clear. And I'll give you a little hint that the South African gold rush was already underway when the Palmyra left Liverpool for South Africa. Jack Douglas intended to import and trade mercury for South Africa had no mercury or mercury mines of its own 
to generate the material necessary to refine gold ore. So since 1887 leads to a rather compressed timeline, we'll de-emphasize it as probably too early and 1890 is probably too late for the events of the epilogue. And we'll check off Benito Canyon and South Africa from our list of confusions. Now let's look at what happened last night in Cape Town. So the Palmyra reaches Cape Town and it docks. And if you're a ship captain choosing an optimum time to enter port and dock, um, you have some preferences. So one is you would like to dock in daylight when you can see what you're doing. And sunset in March in Cape Town is about a quarter after seven o'clock in the evening. It takes about one to two hours to gently bring alongside to a pier a large ship and to tie it up securely. One wants to see the depth of the water during the approach, and there are no electronic measurements for de water depth at this time, which means that you have to have the sun in a position off to the side or the rear of the boat where it doesn't glare from the water into your eyes. So on an afternoon in the Southern Hemisphere, that places the sun to your Northwest, which works fine for the approach shown in the red arrow. You also want a flood tide to help carry the ship into the harbor and a late flood tide when water is already deeper over any shallows around your approach. And so for an evening arrival, high tide should occur between 5 and 8 p.m. And lastly, you want the wind to help guide you toward, not away from the pier. As it turns out, only these dates of March 3rd through the 5th in 1888 meet the criteria for docking the Palmyra just before sunset. The tides are correct and the winds are correct. And if you check the records for 1887, 1889, and 1890, the tides and winds are not correct for an evening arrival. So now we've significantly narrowed the arrival of the Palmyra and Ivy Douglas to Cape Down and avoid, to avoid beating around the bush any further, we shall shortly show that a Saturday arrival does not fit the facts. The Palmyra, in fact, arrived on the evening of Sunday, March 4th, 1888. And now let's add a few more clues to the mix. How does Ivy Douglas send the cablegram from Cape Town last night after the ship's arrival so that it arrives in the hands of Cecil Barker this morning? Well, here is a picture of the Palmyra as she was configured in 1888 in Cape Town, having docked at the pier a half hour before sunset. It would take Ivy and her 700 fellow passengers some time to obtain their baggage and clear customs. And in fact, it's Sunday evening. So from a practical standpoint, they won't do that. They will spend one more night on the ship and uh, disembark on Monday. Nevertheless, Ivy is determined to get a word out that Jack is gone. She has to clear immigration first, but as a first class passenger, she was likely near the head of the queue. And by the time she steps out of the customs house, twilight is ending. It is now too dark to see without the benefit of the recently installed electric lights that you see in this photograph. Ivy walks a half a mile from the customs house at the foot of the pier to the railway station. And in the front corner of the station stands the Cape Town Telegraph office. It is a rough, cramped location, stuffed with customers and staff, hot, and it's smelly. She uses a form plus a carbon to write her message in duplicate, 23 words in total. Unlike today's text and email messaging procedures, the word count of a telegram and its destination determine the cost. To understand what happens next, we need to understand that by the 1880s, a British private company, Eastern Telegraph Company, owned or controlled 90% of the world's undersea telegraph cables as measured by mileage. Eastern's monopoly was the international communications infrastructure of Holmes's era, and its network continued to expand in the following decades. And as a monopoly, Eastern was free to set prices as it wished, subject to a limited amount of oversight by the UK government, which had some financial and policy interests in some of the earliest cables that were laid. The charge for Ivy's cablegram as drafted is almost $1,400 in today's money. But because of their expense, international telegrams were, of course, primarily used by business, the press, and government, and rarely by individuals other than the very wealthy. Everyone, business, press, government, used measures to reduce the word count of cablegrams, and by far the most common tool used was a code. So Scott's code was a public code book employed in the shipping industry. 
The counter clerk, seeing the shock on Ivy's already distressed countenance, suggests that she could apply Scott's code to reduce her costs. By substituting the word hydrocella for the phrase has been lost overboard and acute for no one knows how the accident occurred, her word count drops from 23 to 13. While it's still quite expensive at $800, um, it is better than it was. And it's a good thing that Ivy is now a wealthy widow. After purchasing stamps for this amount and fixing them to the message original, she turns in her form the clerk adds it, the technical details that you see here in the top line and places the form in a tray with others. A few minutes later, a young man takes the form into the instrument room, which unfortunately is located just above the rail station's urinals. Now, part of Ivy's cost pays for domestic transmission of her telegram from the Cape Colony over landline telegraph wires to Durban in the colony of Natal. Telegraph service along these routes was occasionally interrupted by what are described in the records as unsettled and restless natives. But on this particularly Sunday night, no disruptions are recorded. In a few minutes, Ivy's message reaches the head of the queue and is transmitted through to the central telegraph office at Durban, where a clerk transcribes the telegram onto a form used by the Eastern Telegraph Company. And Eastern's cable office is just on the other side of the wall. The clerk passes the message through a window, and it is then transmitted into the first submarine cable, which is a short one between Durban and Delgao Bay in southern Mozambique. Manual transmission on a cable uses a special form of telegraph key, a cable key with two contacts, one used for the dots and one used for the dashes. But manual transmission and the very tedious manual reception have been superseded in the last two years, by machine transmu transmission that uses punched paper tape. Messages are punched into the tape by pressing one lever for a dot, a different lever to make a hole for a dash, and a third lever to advance the tape between the letters and words. And as the tape is pulled through a tape transmitting machine, a hole in the top row will generate a brief negative polarity pulse for a dot, and a hole in the bottom row generates a positive polarity pulse for a dash. So unlike terrestrial telegraph codes, dots and dashes are of the same length. The middle roll has these tiny holes that are used to pull the tape forward. And you can see that here in a tape transmitter in operation. The speed of the tape is calibrated to operate at the fastest speed which the cable's electrical characteristics allow. And for this 400 mile hop to Delagao Bay, the speeds exceed about 30 words per minute. Ivy's message takes about 30 seconds to send which is about twice as long as the video you just saw. A Delagao Bay today in the city of Maputo, the remains of the cable from Durban lie underneath a linear park, as does the cable heading north to Mozambique Island and Zanzibar stations. But in 1888, that park was actually a small river and on its banks was this cable station where Ivy's message arrived and was repeated onto the next cable. Today, that cable station building is a high school. Now, in the 19th century, there were no vacuum tubes, and there was no way to amplify the very weak electrical pulses arriving at the distant end of a submarine cable. And instead, an electromechanical device called a siphon recorder was used. It squirted droplets of ink onto a moving paper tape, just the same way that a modern inkjet printer works. And it makes a line with deviations in it upward and downwards, upward for dots and downwards for dashes. An instrument clerk attends the machine, separates each message, and another clerk would relay Ivy's message by reading the up and down squiggly line and then punching a new transmitting tape. A few minutes later, Ivy's recreated message tape joins the queue for the next cable to Mozambique Island in northern Mozambique. At Mozambique Island, the message is similarly repeated onto one of two cables to Zanzibar. Ivy's message will arrive at Bawe Island, which today is a private resort. I'd love to visit. It looks beautiful and the weather is very pleasant there. Bawe Island lies a short distance from the main island of Zanzibar and a short cable connects to the Eastern Telegraph offices in the old port city. These buildings were used to deliver cables to in, within Zanzibar and to collect cablegrams for transmission to the rest of the world. Now, 
As a company, one does not simply show up in a cable ship, take over a small island, lay some cables, and build some buildings. One needs to obtain formal landing rights and a concession, and those are granted by the local government. And on Zanzibar, for the first cable that was laid in 1879, the local government was a part of Oman, and it was run by this man, Saeed Bargash bin Saeed, the third Omani Sultan of Zanzibar. Initially, he granted Eastern a 10-year lease on Baiwai Island, which was now about to expire. But Bargash only lived three weeks longer after Ivy's message passed through his sultanate. Within two years, Zanzibar would become a British protectorate, and Baiwai Island, now under British control, was subsequently developed into a larger hub in the Eastern Telegraph Company network, with additional cables laid to Dar es Salaam in today's Tanzania, Mombasa and Kenya, and the Seychelles Islands. And they used this new cable ship, the Great Northern, to lay and maintain those cables. The Great Northern and its crews and supplies were home-based in Zanzibar and kept uh, care of all of the cables in the Indian Ocean region. Concessions and landing rights took time to negotiate. John Pender, who is the founder of the Eastern Telegraph Company, sent his son James to handle these negotiations along the East African coast in 1878. And his wife, Rose, Lady Rose Pender, wrote a book about their experiences, which you can find on Google. It's light reading, but it is a firsthand account of the complexities of travel and cross-cultural perceptions outside Western Europe and the days of Holmes and Watson. And five years later, she wrote another book about their experiences in the American Wild West. And since we live in Denver, that will be of interest. <laughs> Ivy's message then continued north to the Aden Cable Station at the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. The Zanzibar to Aden Cable is the longest over which her message will travel, and it's a length equivalent to the distance from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles. Aden was a major junction point in submarine cables with two long cables to Bombay carrying traffic to India, Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand, and up the coast to uh, East Asia. And it had three cables going up the Red Sea. Conditions on Aden could not be more different than those on Zanzibar. It was an isolated location and extremely hot. Aden staff totaled about 60 persons organized into rotating shifts. Housing and meals were provided for everyone, including their families, along with schools, entertainment, and athletic facilities, and the additional staff to provide all those amenities. So you can look at these remote stations as small, isolated company villages, and yet their inhabitants were among the very first to know of any news event occurring in the world. Press reports about the tragedy of Burlstone last January may well have been discussed over the breakfast table at Aden Station long before they were published in the evening papers in Australia. Now, at this time of night, Aden Station is becoming increasingly busy when Ivy's message arrives less than an hour after its transmission from Durban and Natal. Although it's shortly after midnight, Aden is busy clearing the last press messages. In the priority screen for cablegrams, press sent at a discounted rate, is of lowest priority and it typically moves overnight. Now, as dawn is occurring in East Asia, financial market reports for Japan and Australia are coming in for Reuters along with Monday morning's business traffic. The cables to the east will become increasingly busy even while press and other traffic arrives from East Africa. And here we can clearly see what was meant by Brother Morris's telegraph operator friend back east who wrote, it's a queer cipher that you handle by the yard. Bertie Edwards' messages were recorded on paper tape, too, as they arrived back east for delivery. And those long messages were divided into parts, each containing a maximum of 200 words. A 200-word message uses about 50 feet of tape. And a busy time at Aden Station would generate over five miles of tape during one shift. Since Ivy's message has priority over press, it doesn't wait long at Aden. The next hop up the Red Sea cables ends at Port Suez, and here Eastern Telegraph has a geographical impediment. There is no sea route to Alexandria on the Mediterranean coast where the next submarine cable starts. Acquiring both landing rights and the right to build a private terrestrial telegraph line across Egypt requires negotiations with the Ottoman Empire, which is represented by a man with one of the best job titles ever, the sublime port, which is a euphemism for the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, 
Abu Dal Major the first. The Sultan had granted in the past a concession to bring cables ashore in Alexandria to a failed Mediterranean cable uh, venture whose assets were purchased by Eastern Telegraph Company. And Eastern Telegraph also acquired a failed Red Sea cable venture whose assets included a concession for a two-wire telegraph line between Suez and Alexandria via Cairo, and that was granted by Pasha the Magnificent, Ismail I, the Khedive of Egypt. There was, however, a steep price to pay by the company for sending telegrams along this line, 5% of the gross receipts from each telegram, and $50 in the case of Ivy's, if it had gone through this line. So it turns out that this man's uncle and predecessor, Said of Egypt, had incurred significant debts to France for the construction of the Suez Canal and debts to Britain for the construction of a rail line between Alexandria and Cairo, not to mention costs of building irrigation canals and a domestic telegraph network. In 1875, with the national debt standing at $12.5 billion in today's terms, he sold Egypt's shares in the Suez Canal to Britain which is part of how Britain got control of the Suez. After a period of joint French and British control of Egypt's governmental finances, an Egyptian coup pushed out the French. Britain was now very nervous about their investments here and took over administration of Egypt by simply bombarding Alexandria in 1882 and then invading the rest of the country. And it used troops that were transmitted in part by Ivy Douglas's future ride to Cape Town, the Palmyra. With the British in control, Eastern Telegraph obtained a free concession to build an overland telegraph line along the Suez Canal to Port Said and a submarine cable to Alexandria. And this is the route that was actually taken by Ivy's cablegram. Minutes later, her message was on a cable to Malta and from Malta onward to Gibraltar and Carcavelos just outside of Lisbon. The Carcavelos cable station shown here was another concentration point in the Eastern Telegraph Network, for here also arrived traffic from South America and West Africa. And then on one of these three cable routes, Ivy's message traveled to this cable hut in Porth Kerno near Land's End, England. 18 days earlier, uh, during an unusually violent thunderstorm around Land's End, lightning struck the sea near the cables. And siphon recorders in the instrument room on the Carcavelos cables had their coils fused by the strike. Fortunately, these were quickly repaired, and Ivy's message arrived safely at the end of its undersea journey, less than two hours from its departure from Durban. Her message was punched into tape for high-speed transmission via a dedicated overhead telegraph wire to the Eastern Telegraph Central Office in London, where the short dot long dash form of telegraph code was recorded onto tape. Ivy's message was then written out by hand on a paper form. And that form along with other messages was stuffed into a cylinder and dropped into a pneumatic tube where it traveled under the streets of London to Brit the British post office's enormous central telegraph office at St. Martin Le Grand Square. Now this building shown here occupies a full acre for each floor, and about a thousand people were working here on duty that March night. On the first floor, you can see here along the rear wall, the pneumatic tube carriers uh, arriving uh, in these tubes, and the message that, messages that they contain were sorted at tables along that back wall. And those like Ivy's message that were for metropolitan London destinations were sent upstairs by other tubes to the Metropolitan Instrument Room. Now, the post office employed both men and women as instrument operators and at equal pay, but the overnight shift was restricted to men only. And despite this large crowd that you see here, the room is quiet for the operators need to hear signals on their assigned lines. Ivy's message has arrived here, and here it just sits. Its destination, the Hampstead Telegraph Office, had closed earlier at 8 p.m. on Sunday. On Monday morning, March 5th, the skies dawned with a chilly, overcast view. The Hampstead Telegraph Office was located at the Finchley Road and Frognell Rail Station, and a half a dozen employees arrived at 7 a.m. to prepare for opening. 
a senior instrument operator took control of the line to London to begin to clear the backlog of overnight messages. And yes, she was married. Exceptionally, in telegraph offices, skilled female operators were encouraged to continue working after marriage, in contrast to most other Victorian pr uh, professions open to women. There were tele 20 telegraph lines passing through the Hampstead station, but 19 of them were long distance wires to other parts of the UK. A few of them leased solely to press traffic for specific newspapers in bigger cities. Only one line is used for Hampstead and it's shared with a couple of other nearby telegraph offices. But eventually Ivy's cablegram is received, written out longhand and duplicate by the operator and acknowledged. In a manner that persists until the mid 20th century, a clerk logs the message and assigns it to a messenger boy for delivery to Cecil Barker's nearby home. Now that was a lot of information about one cablegram, but Watson hints at a second cablegram from Cape Town. So in the pre-dawn hours of this same freezing gray March Monday morning, an unknown person slips an NMA note into the letterbox of 221B. To understand this event, Let's go back a bit to the Palmyra with Jack and Ivy Douglas aboard in a gale off St. Helena Island. Any of you who've been on the open ocean in a gale know that it's a noisy experience. The wind is loud, waves slap hard up against the side of the ship. And with the wind, the rain, the pitching and the rolling of the deck, no passengers would be allowed outside. And at night, the noise and darkness form a perfect cover for two strong seamen to seize Jack Douglas in a passageway, perhaps on his way to the toilet. They press a chloroform rag over his mouth and nose until he passes out. They haul his inert body up a ladder onto the heaving deck and then just simply roll him over the railing into the sea. It's but 10 minutes work. After days of waiting for an opportunity, to commit murder for a little extra pay from someone who will meet them in Cape Town on the evening of their arrival. And that local agent working for Moriarty pays them off when it becomes apparent that Jack Douglas is not on board. This agent then walks a half a mile along the waterfront to the railway station and enters the telegraph office, joining the queue, perhaps standing next to a woman with a distressed countenance wearing a black armband. And she wears a black armband because she would have not thought it necessary to pack black morning dress in her stateroom luggage. This agent composes a short message of just three words to one of Moriarty's cutout minions in central London, near enough to Eastern's central telegraph office that the cable company simply sends a messenger boy to deliver that cable grant around midnight. The minion, as per previous instructions, writes out, dear me, Mr. Holmes, dear me, on a piece of paper, and gives it to another hired boy who walks through the crowded nighttime streets of Victorian London in the smoky darkness of that dry, freezing Monday morning of March 5th, 1888. And his unknown hand slips the note through the letter slot of 221B Baker Street and walks away. Well, stage manage is the correct description. And that's how Holmes came to receive a note from someone who had received a cable. Now we have just a few loose ends to clear up. Cecil Barker received his cable mid-morning, but didn't visit Holmes until late that night. So what was he doing during the intervening hours? Well, what would you do if a messenger boy handed you this message? Jack Hydrocella, Gail St. Helena, acute, Ivy Douglas. Barker put on his coat, hat, and gloves and walked over to the Hampstead Telegraph office to ask for an explanation. And the counter clerk there cannot explain anything, unfortunately. She doesn't work in a port city and she is unfamiliar with Scott's code, but she does advise Barker to check with the Eastern Telegraph office in London because perhaps the staff there might have an appropriate code book for clearly this is a code. It's late Monday morning by the time Jack walks across, to, Cecil walks across to the Metropolitan Railway Finchley Road station. He changes at Baker Street for Moorgate, and by midday, a clerk at Eastern, after testing a few frequently used public code books, finds that Scott's code unlocks the meaning of this message. One could hardly blame Cecil Barker for heading to the nearest bar for a stiff drink. 
and in the course of the first round or two, the thought might have occurred to him that he should find some way to verify the authenticity of the message. Was that really from Ivy? There have been reports of fake messages, what we would call Victorian spam. And there's another mystery. How did Barker know that the ship arrived last night? Nothing in Ivy Douglas's cablegram mentions its arrival time. Watson has failed to tell us that there is a third cablegram from Cape Town. When the Palmyra docked at Cape Town last night, she was met by Cunard's local shipping and booking agent. After conferring with the captain, the agent walks the half mile from the customs house along the waterfront to the railway station and enters the telegraph office. He doesn't join a queue containing a grieving widow or Moriarty's local agent because none of the seamen or passengers have gotten off the ship yet. The Cunard agent needs to send this cablegram to Cunard headquarters in London. Palmyra, a plotter, one, quails, quicksand, overboard. It too uses Scott's code to convey in just these eight words that the Palmyra arrived Sunday between 6 p.m. and midnight one death occurred during the voyage, have lost a passenger overboard. This cablegram travels the same route to London and from Eastern Central Telegraph Office in Moorgate is delivered immediately to Cunard's headquarters. The overnight staff there record the arrival of the Palmyra and forward that report to Lloyd's of London, who in turn forward it to other newspapers that have subscribed to shipping news for publication. So, which newspaper would Barker consult? There are 14 London papers available to us in the British Newspaper Archive. We can eliminate six of them right away because their editions appear in the evening and Cecil and it's Monday afternoon. And two papers only cover sports, so we can exclude them. The public ledger and daily advertiser doesn't print any shipping news. And the homeward mail from India, China, and the East only prints shipping news from Asia. The Daily Telegraph and the Morning Post actually do print shipping news, but they only print, print it for shipping events in Britain. They don't carry arrivals and departures at foreign ports. And that leaves us with just these two. Lloyd's List is an obvious choice, along with the Shipping Gazette. Gazette. Both of these print comprehensive lists of ship sightings, arrivals, and departures. But these are trade specialist publications. An issue of Lloyd's, if you could find it, would cost about a dollar in today's money. And by the way, neither the Daily News, nor Lloyd's List, nor the Shipping Gazette are published on Sunday. So the Palmyra could not have arrived on a Saturday night, March 3rd, and been printed up in a Sunday paper. The Daily News costs just 25 cents and it's widely available. So when Barker wanders out of the bar to find a news agent and a paper with shipping news, the shop attendant is going to direct him to the daily news, which is not very big in page count. It's just eight large pages. 1888 was before the introduction of the linotype machine in London. So everything on the page involved labor intensive handset type. Eight columns of small type, in fact. And here is page one for Monday, March 5th, 1888. And if we look on page two, as Barker did, we find a column labeled Mail and Steamship News. Unfortunately, at the top of the column, it says that this news is from Lloyd's on March 3rd, which would be Friday, and that's not going to be any help at all. But if you look a little further down the page, Near the bottom, it says latest telegrams, and it's organized in alphabetical order by city. And here Cecil Barker reads, Cape Town, March 4th, Palmyra from London arrived at 7 p.m. Again, we cannot blame Barker for heading back to the bar to mourn the life of Jack Douglas for a few hours and then requesting a visit with Holmes at night. And for us, there remains one last question. Why did Holmes write late last night. If we review the events of March 4th and 5th, we see that Watson wrote up the epilogue to the Valley of Fear on March 6th, Tuesday, and writing late last night naturally refers to Barker's arrival the previous evening. So here we see that insights into, leg into telegraphy and technology have revealed the background to events which Watson left unrecorded. And to quote the master, if there are any questions, 
I shall be happy to give you any other details which may interest you. Thank you for your attention. Derek, you're muted, I think. I just wanted to stop the sharing so I could see if there was uh, were any questions, but let's give a virtual round of applause to Eric for an excellent talk. Um, we do have time for one or two questions. Anybody, uh, if you'd like to um, just unmute and ask or put a question in the chat and I can read it, either way is fine. Uh, Larry, are you trying to ask a question? Larry made this <laughs> no, observation just... that five pounds equals eight hundred dollars in eighteen eighty eight. Yeah, that's true. Yes. <laughs> well, all I have, all I have really is comments. I mean, it was an awesome presentation. I can see why you win awards, and I'm embarrassed about mine now. I don't want I don't want to do mine anymore. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's uh, it, it was incredible. I'm 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 so glad you recorded it, Derek, because I'd like to listen to it when I'm not having my own in mind. My, half my brain is thinking about the one I'm going to do, but um, amazing all the stuff that's involved. Just it's just it's just amazing, and, and, and I never gave it a thought, you know, about what, what could go into an individual telegram. But that is amazing. It makes me want to read the Valley of Fear over again. Everything. It, it's really amazing. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah, the Valley is one of my favorite stories. Yeah. Eric, I'm curious to know, I mean, you did extensive research. This, I mean, that's just, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if extensive is the right word. I'm just wondering how long did it take you um, to to fully research and write this article that, that you presented to us? Uh, huh. Well, it's hard to say because I got interested when I got a copy of um, the an annotated Sherlock Holmes, not lesses, but uh, one of the earlier ones. And I started going through it, reading the stories again. And every time I came across a reference to a telegram or a cablegram, I put a post-it note in the paper. <laughs> and I was just started to get curious about this because at the time I was working professionally on putting fiber optic cables under the seafloor for the what uh, we now know as the internet. And one of the companies I worked with was a company called Cable and Wireless, which had archives out at Porth Kerno in England. And a guy that I was working with, who is the head of their Japanese operation, said, you should go to their corporate museum. And from there, it was like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. And it says so much about what's going on in Holmes's time. So that was like 27 years ago, 26 years ago. Um, so this is information I've been accumulating gradually over time. Very cool. You definitely think like a writer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you again. And um, next up, we have Dr. Ed Chan. Are you about ready to go, Ed? Oops. Oh, I thought Larry was going next. Okay. Did I mix it? I mean, it, it, I can it's have okay. Larry go. Okay. No, I can go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can go. Um, let me share my. Uh... Well, hold on. Let me introduce you. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Chan was born in Rangoon, Burma, now known as Yangon, Myanmar, and emigrated with his family to Manitou Springs, Colorado, in 1967. He grew up in Colorado Springs, went to college there, and attended medical school in New York City. He is married and has two grown children, both living in Denver, Colorado. He served in the U.S. Air Force for four years. He currently takes care of patients at the Rocky Mountain Regional VA Medical Center and does his research in mycobacteria at National Jewish Health. He enjoys hiking, biking, and reading, and of course, Sherlock Holmes stories, so let's give a virtual warm welcome to Dr. Chan. All right, and now you can share your screen. You are on. Okay. You should have a share screen at the bottom or you should have access to it. Yeah. Okay.
There we go. Perfect. So uh, I want to thank uh, Derek uh, for inviting me to give this um, talk. Um, I noticed that when we were all sort of logging in, I recognized an I I recognize a name that I didn't know before, and that's Dallinger. And I think it's Susan Dallinger, who I, forgive me, but I don't think I know her. But the reason I recognize that name is because I have referenced, I think, a paper that she wrote on this very topic, which will come up in a few slides coming down here. So I'd be very interested uh, if this is the same S. H. Dallinger that's and uh, that has written a paper about this. Um, be very interesting to get her interested to get her thoughts as well. Um, so this is a uh, uh, something that I work with uh, with Bill Dorn, as some as most of you probably know. Bill Dorn um, recently passed away, but he was a member of. DWNP for a number of years. Um, and um, let me put on a, a screen here. And he was a DWNP for a number of years, but he was also a, a BSI member as well. Um, and, you know, I occasionally I would have lunch with Bill Dorn over the years. And this is one of our lunch in 2018 in which he scribbled something, I think on a napkin. I can't remember what this is about. <laughs> Um, looks like chicken scratch, um, but it's probably something very important that I wish I knew what it was now. Be kind of a, a, it's a it's too late to ask him what he meant by these e equation and symbols and everything. But I remember over our discussion that he would talk about like different types of reasonings, um, and this is just a side thing to what I'm going to be talking about, but. Um, and I couldn't remember exactly what he said, but I remember he talked about deductive reasoning, um, uh, inductive reasoning, and reductive reasoning. And you know, we always think of Sherlock Holmes as like deducing something, and you know, based on his thinking skills and everything. And I remember Bill Dorn always keeps saying the way he thinks is not deductive reasoning, and I didn't really understand it until like yesterday when I sort of uh, put this slide in there in my talk. Um, so deductive reasoning is that you begin with a theory and you support it with uh, various observation that you, that you see. Um, and that's really is like opposite of what Sherlock Holmes talks about, right? Um, you know, you all know much a lot more about the Ken's than I do, but I, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to read you a, a quote by by Holmes in Scandal in Bohemia, in which he says, "It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts." And so, the type of thinking that he argues for is really opposite of the deductive reasoning. I guess it's more supportive of the type of thinking that he does is more supportive of inductive reasoning, where one begins with an observation and looks for, I guess, patterns or you know, um, cons consistency and then form a hypothesis or theory. I think this is probably more consistent with the way Sherlock Holmes solves a case or you know, go goes about his his uh, observational skills. But I think if if I remember Bill correctly, I think he, I remember he says, it's not really deductive, it's not really inductive. And I couldn't remember what he said was the way Sherlock Holmes thinks. So I just sort of Google things and I came up with this, another way of reasoning known as reductive um, reasoning. And I think this one really fits best with the way Sherlock Holmes uh, thinks and how he recommends you should approach a case in which he ha has an observed set of facts uh, and then forms a set of premises or causes based on the observed set of facts. And I think we would all agree that this is what he just uh, um, 
said when uh, of the quote I just mentioned from a scandal in Bo Bohemia. So this is just a, a, a side thing um, in, in honor of, of Bill Dorn. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about, let me see if I can get this thing off my screen here. Okay, yeah. So what I'm going to be talking about mainly is the adventure of a dying detective. And, you know, even though I belong to WNP and I've been a member since I think either 1993 or 1994, um, I haven't read all the canons yet. And, um, you know, uh, whatever I read, I usually forget, forget about it. So, um, but just to, um, as a background on the adventure of dying detective, which was written in 1913, I think that date is important. So remember that. Uh, Culverton Smith is the antagonist. He's a plant and tropical disease expert. Um, and th the story begins uh, with a little background that he had killed his nephew, Victor Savage, with, a, with what presumed to be a deadly agent or microbe. And as Holmes came to, to closer to solving the crime, um, Smith had mailed Holmes a booby trap package containing the same deadly agent or, or microbe. And then Holmes begins, you know, the, the, the story begins with Holmes uh, feigning an illness to basically to entice Smith to, to confess, because I assume that, you know, Smith is like a braggart and wanted to, to show that, you know, he, he got the upper hand over Holmes. So in the story, Holmes is described as being gaunt with wasted face, with cold sweats glimmered upon his brows, his eyes had the brightness of fever. The eyes shone more brightly out of darker hollows, I guess because of the, you know, it, it, he just looked very haggard at that time. And there was a hectic flush upon uh, both his cheeks and dark, dark crust uh, clung to his lips. And he had little gas with struggles for breath uh, and made sound between a cough and a sob. His voice was croaking and spasmodic, and his thin hands upon the coverlet twitched incessantly. So Holmes is obviously uh, malingering in illness. And later on, he reveals to Watson how he was he was very convincing that he was he, he was sick. He says, I give you my word that for three days I have tasted neither food or drink. And he put Vaseline upon one's forehead to make it look like he was sweating. And he put belladonna, uh, I assume, drop on his eyes. And I don't know if you guys know what belladonna is. It contains atropine. And atropine basically dilates the pupil. And the reason why it's called belladonna is, you know, for beautiful girl, beautiful woman, is I, I think that women used to put belladonna in eyes to make their pupils look big, dark uh, um, pupils. And he put rouge over his cheekbones and crust of beeswax over his, his lips as well to make himself look ill. Uh, but the feigned illness is never revealed by name, okay? And so this was the purpose of Bill Dorn and I's uh, paper to try to come up with what we think is going on with um, what, what Doyle was thinking of what illness he was thinking of um, when, when Holmes was uh, feigning this illness. So did uh, Conan Doyle have a particular disease in mind when he wrote The Dying Detective? And we came to a conclusion that he must have had a particular disease in mind because he was a physician and he knew about infectious diseases and tropical medicine. His thesis was on syphilis. Uh, his first wife, Louise, died from tuberculosis in 1906. So seven years before this uh, paper was, uh, this story was published. Uh, Doyle lived in, in the period when giants and infectious disease made great discoveries. Um, you know, like Lister, Pasteur, Koch, who um, described the organism that causes tuberculosis. And in fact, um, Doyle actually went to a meeting in, I, I can't remember where, I think it was in Berlin that Koch was giving a talk on and basically challenged Koch on his TB vaccine at that time. And Doyle was actually right. That TB vaccine never worked. 
and other people like Ehrlich. Ross was a discoverer of malaria, I think, in the Central America. And Yersin, I highlighted in I in red there, because Yersin was in Hong Kong to try to find out the cause, the 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 the, the, mi the microbial cause for uh, plague. And in fact, the plague organism is called Yersinia pestis because um, Yersin was a tr was um, attributed being the first discoverer for for the organism that caused the plague. And Doyle in 1881 was a ship surgeon on a cargo passenger ship to West Africa. So he must have seen a lot of diseases, especially infectious disease um, at, at that time. So initial clues that the, the disease um, that, um, that Culverton Smith was trying to inflict upon Doyle was an infectious agent was that uh, Culverton Smith's description of himself. He said he is an amateur of crime uh, saying, um, uh, Holmes, as I am of disease. For him, the villain, for me, the micro. And he points to his cultivation, his his uh, culture uh, flask, I guess. He says, there are my prisons. Among those gelatin cultivations, some of my very worst offenders of the world are now doing time. I thought that was just a very incredible description of his, of his microbes that he was growing in his laboratory, home laboratory. Um, Holmes also mentioned that about the disease that he was feigning. It is a coolie disease from Sumatra, and it's the same disease that was have killed, uh, to have uh, felt to have killed Victor Savage, that uh, Culverton Smith's uh, nephew that he he murdered. It is a coolie disease from Sumatra. It is infallibly deadly and it is horribly contagious. So just by being contagious, it really suggests that this was an infectious disease and not some poison or something like that. Um, Smith also said, uh, very surprising that he, you know, Victor Savage, Smith's murder nephew, should have contracted an out of way Asiatic disease in the heart of London, a disease too, to which I have made such a very special study. Um, so this disease in London at that time was felt not to be endemic. So it was felt to be imported from Asia at that time. And presumably, Culverton Smith was uh, cultivating this bacteria in his home laboratory as well. So there are some clues which may not be so reliable. So Holmes had um, told, I think, Watson, he contracted this illness in Rotherheat in an alley near the river. Rotherheat, I had to look up, but it's sort of like along the Thames. It's a part of London along the Thames, and it's considered to be a port uh, at, at the time. So there was a lot of sailors and people coming from different parts of the world coming to this port uh, part of, of, of London. And the reason for its unreliability was that it could have been simply made up by Holmes because Holmes uh, did not want to let anyone know of uh, Smith's murderous attempt. You know, he didn't want uh, Watson to know necessarily know that. Um, but it does not exclude the possibility, as I mentioned previously, that it could have been an imported disease from Asia because it was a port area of, of London and could have been imported and contracted in London as well. The other clue or comments made in the story that may not be reliable is that um, Holmes wanted Watson to go fetch Culverton Smith. But he wanted Watson to sound convincing that you know that he really is dying. Holmes really is dying. So uh, when um, Watson, I think, wanted to bring other physicians to come see Holmes, he and or or to come treat him and himself, he says, "If I'm if I am to have a doctor, whether I will or not, let me at least have someone in whom I have confidence." You are only a, a general practitioner with very limited experience and mediocre qualifications. And he tells Watson, what do you know of Tapaluni fever? And what do you know about Black Formosan corruption? And the reason for its unreliability in, in terms of the clue to the, to the underlying illness is that Holmes uh, belittled Watson to convince the doctor that only Culverton Smith knows enough of the disease to be of any help. 
And these eponyms, Tapaluni fever and Black Formosan corruption for the feigned illness may have been contrived by Holmes to convince Watson to, to, to retrieve Culverton Smith. So what about Tapaluni fever or Black Formosan corruption? Again, obviously I had to look this up. Tapaluni is a region of Sumatra and in Indonesia. Formosa is another name for Taiwan. So it's in the South China Sea, Indian Ocean area. And um, looking up various sources of tropical diseases and dictionaries, et cetera, no such eponyms exist that I can find in the medical literature. So it's very possible that it was just made up um, by Holmes at that time. The other possibility is that, you know, some of these older names of diseases could have been just lost through time as well, and or, or could have been very local, lo locally named. It's interesting that Sumatra is mentioned twice in The Dying Detective, uh, in which, um, you know, uh, Holmes mentioned it is a coolie disease from Sumatra. And Culverton Smith uh, was mentioned to be a well-known resident of Sumatra as well. So additional clues to the infectious nature of the illness. Um, Holmes was described as being moribund three days after inoculation, right? And Culverton Smith's nephew, Victor Savage, died four days after ino inoculation. They were both, um, the disease was considered to be infallibly deadly. So very, you know, other than poisons, right? Nothing kills people this quickly. So, or I, I guess a vascular disease could kill somebody quickly as well, but really suggests that this was, and then by being saying that it was horribly contagious, it really suggests that this was an infectious agent that um, Holverton Smith was trying to um, kill, kill Holmes with. So other signs and symptoms I sort of mentioned already, there was, you know, all those things that I mentioned um, previously was really consistent with an infection. He also had a respiratory illness with his shortness of breath and the cough. And, uh, and there was other signs of sepsis, which is basically a blood, essentially a bloodstream infection, right? He was noted to be delirious. Um, I think this is a favorite quote of some members of the, Dr. Watson's um, neglected patient. It says, uh, Holmes was sounding delirious when he says, I cannot think why the whole bed of ocean is not one solid mass of oysters, so prolific the creatures seem. Uh, and we know that people who have sepsis, it's a bloodstream infection, can become quite delirious um, at the, at, during the severe uh, phases of it. And you know, with sepsis, you can have high, high, uh, hypotension or low blood pressure. And so he was, you know, that's maybe another reason why they're also delirious as well. And he also was feigning like having cramps. And then Smith uh, said to Holmes when, when Holmes was having one of these cramping episodes, he says, painful is it? Yes, the coolies used to do some squealing towards the end. Takes you as cramp, I fancy. And later on, I'll show a, a reference showing that um, the disease that we think is that Holmes is feigning is also be, can be associated with cramps as well. So uh, this is where, the, so we weren't the first people to think about this, right? I mean, there's many, many articles that's been written on what illness Holmes could have been feigning at the time. And one, you know, there's been papers written about the scrub typhus. And one thing that's argues against it is that it cannot, it's, a, it's caused by an organism known as rickettsia. Uh, it's sort of a difference, it's a little bit different than uh, bacteria, but they cannot be grown on simple gelatin, okay? Snake venom has been also hypothesized to be the agent that caught, caused the death of Victor Savage. Uh, but Smith is not known to be uh, a herpetologist and venom kills much faster than three to four days, generally. Uh, meliodosis is another bacteria that's found in Southeast Asia. It, interestingly, it was described in, first described in 1912 at Rangoon General Hospital. Um, 
in Burma, the country where I was born. And you know, Burma used to be a British colony. It can cause it's a bacterial infection, can cause sepsis, pneumonia, etc. But meliodosis is not horribly contagious. Uh, anthrax is a possibility because it can, you know, be inoculated through the skin. Uh, but cutaneous anthrax has a mortality rate of only 20%. You know, uh, when you have sepsis and other forms of anthrax, the the, the mortality rate is obviously much higher. Um, but uh, we don't think that's the case either. We think that the cause of this um, of this illness, or that the illness that uh, Holmes was feigning and the cause and the and and the disease that killed uh, Victor Savage, was was plague. And we weren't obviously the first person to think about this. Uh, Cole Ellie uh, wrote it in 1959. Anne Rickrantz wrote it in 1987 that they thought that um, that the that the disease that uh, Holmes was feigning was plague. And again, I saw this name in our meeting just now of S. Salinger, uh, Dallinger, and. Um, I assume it's the same person. And she wrote about the case files of Sherlock Holmes, the dying detective. And I think she also mentioned that it was probably due to plague. So I'd be happy to get her thoughts on it as well. So is it plague? Well, the disease plague was so devastating, you know, in the especially in the uh, Middle Ages, that the word plague has become synonymous with curse or affliction. So plague can be used as a calamity, right? Um, it can be used as a destructively an influx of numerous agents, such as a plague of locusts, it has been used to describe an epidemic disease causing high mortality. So not necessarily the, the disease plague itself, but any other pandemic that can cause high mortality. Uh, the virulent, um, and plague is caused by a bacteria that's very contagious known as Yersinia pestis, because it was um, is named after Yersin, who was a Frenchman who in Hong Kong, a British colony, um, where he dis, uh, discovered the, the organism that caused plague in, in Hong Kong. So plague has single-handedly altered man's history. Um, it's been said that there's been three main pandemics uh, of plague throughout man, mankind. The first one was in the sixth and seventh century, and it was comprised of 11 different epidemics. It affected North Africa, Europe, Middle East, West Asia. Um, and it's felt to begin uh, when like infected grain from Egypt went through the Holy Roman Empire through Constantinople. And the, the grains were infected with mice, which carried fleas. And plague is a bacteria that's transmitted by fleas that are um, that are um, uh, that are um, spread by 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 rats. Okay, so the fleas are on the rats. They come off the rats. They bite the human beings, and they contain the the bacteria that causes plague. The second pandemic is probably the one that's most well known. It occurred in the Middle Ages from the 14th to the 17th century. And it's known as the Black Death, as some of you may heard of. And it's felt to have caused, during this very short period in the 1300s, 20 to 30 million deaths at the time. And it's considered the single most important event for modern uh, man because it killed so many people at that time when there wasn't that many people in the world. And the third pandemic, which we are still in, began felt to be began in 1855 to the present. Um, and it's felt to have uh, spread from China and India, where it caused many millions of deaths. And then from there, it spread worldwide because of all the travel throughout the oceans and everything. And in 1994, probably the last major outbreak was in India of, of plague. And you know, as, as I mentioned, um, the, the Dying Detective was written in 1913. So it was around the same period of this third pandemic right here. And uh, British occupied Hong Kong uh, was the site where uh, plague was identified uh, to be caused by this bacteria. 
And it was a really a, a rival between Yersin and Kitasado. They were both in Hong Kong trying to find out what was the cause for plague. And they were trying to be the first to identify the causative agent of, of plague. And they probably both um, identified the bacteria at the same time, but Yersin was credited as having discovered it first. And Doyle was keenly aware of plague in his other writings. And I don't know these stories, but like the White Company, Hilda Wade, and Daily Express, he specifically talks about plague. And he also, in the White Company, talks about the rat uh, as being uh, a foul living creature, uh, affinity for all foul things uh, as being the potential source for diseases as well, which we know is the carrier for the uh, fleas that causes, that carries the organism that causes plague. So in summary, um, you know, Manson, Patrick Manson was a, a very well-known physician uh, in tropical diseases. He published many editions of his famous tropical diseases book. And he mentioned that demonic plague is generally fa fatal in from three to four days. And as you know, more, um, Holmes was feigning to be moribund after day three, and Victor Savage died after four days after inoculation. And other features that support plague in the dying detective is that the organism that causes plague can be cultured on gelatin agar at room temperature. It doesn't need an incubator. And so we think that, um, that Culverton Smith was culturing plague in his... Uh, in his uh, uh, home laboratory at the time. Uh, it can be inoculated by the skin. And as you know, uh, he sent Holmes this booby trap device, which if Holmes had opened it, would have inoculated him with this agent. It can cause a deadly sepsis syndrome with all the features that Holmes was feigning. And uh, Patrick Manson, uh, this infectious, this uh, tropical medicine physician, describe a prodrome of plague that included aching of the limbs and Holmes was feigning cramps at the time as well. It is, especially mnemonic plague, is, it is infallibly deadly and is horribly contagious. Um, and from 1894 to 1918, uh, the British colonies of Hong Kong and India were at the epicenters for the third plague pandemic. And the the story was written in, or was published in 1913. So it's about the right time frame as well. Um, and in terms of its uh, out of the way Asiatic disease in the heart of London, you know, even though in the Middle Ages, Europe was in that second pandemic of plague, by 1913, you know, it really it had not become endemic at that time in England at all. And so it would have been an out of the way Asiatic disease in the heart of London, right? It could have been transported, transported by uh, or imported uh, by ships or sailors uh, who were traveling in Asia, coming to the port area of Rother Heat as well. And you know, plague at that time, I'm sure, was involving Formosa and Sumatra at the time. Um, and like I mentioned, you know. In 1913, in the early 1900s, plague was not endemic. In fact, Patrick Benson said that the disease had visited England as a widespread epidemic or end endemic. It was it was not in it was an endemic. Uh, um, it was last to be known to be an endemic disease in the in the 1600s. And. Um, Patrick, uh, in terms of Rother heat, Patrick Manson had also mentioned in recent years and from time to time, cases of plague have occurred in the port of London in seamen from Eastern countries, Asia, and plague infected rats are by no means uncommon in docks of the metropolis. So uh, I'd be happy to take any question, but I'd be happy to uh, have um, Susan Dallinger comment as well. Okay, let's give a virtual round of applause for Dr. Chan. Thank you. And any uh, any questions for Ed? 
Good. Okay, Michael, do you have a Hi, question? How are you doing? And I, I just clarify for me, and I, I because I'm not I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV. <laughs> um, the, the when you say plague, I th everybody thinks of black plague. Is plague sort of a what would you call all around catchword catchphrase for? Uh, respiratory disease because you're re specifically referring to it as mnemonic and, yeah and yeah. Holmes doesn't have any of the buboes that the the uh, black plague is associated with right yeah th there's there's actually so I am talking about the disease called plague which is caused by a particular type of bacteria known as Yersinia pestis right and Plague, the, the plague that I'm talking about is the disease that caused the black plague, okay? And there's three main forms of plague. There's the bubonic plague, which you cause the lymph node enlargements right. you know, like under the armpits in the groin area and the neck area. That's bubonic plague. And that usually has a better prognosis than the mnemonic, mnemonic plague, pneumonia. That has the, like, the worst prognosis. And probably just as worse is the septicemic plague in which plague goes into the bloodstream and basically spreads throughout all the organs. So the pneumonic plague and the septicemic plague are the ones that causes the most severe form of plague. The bubonic plague is probably still very severe, but not as severe. And in terms of the black plague, there's probably all different things, right? It depends on your own immune system. If, you're, if your immune system is- yeah. This is, no, this is the Sherlock Holmes 50th anniversary. And my doctor, Chan, just gave a very brilliant 25 minute speech on how the one disease in this one Sherlock story could not have been the plague. And I thought it was fascinating. I was very impressed by him. And he's a big doctor and he worked for the Air Force. He was in the Air Force and he, it, was, it was really good what they did with him. I was very, very happy to see him. Thanks, Sally. Yeah. Um, you're, you're my boy Mike is your mic is on. Zoom to, I'm gonna zoom. I'm gonna email him tonight. Tell him how much I like. Oh, yeah. So Michael, that's a good question. So what I was talking about was plague itself, because that would be very very deadly. And I think because of the temporal identification of plague in real life versus the time that the dying detective was published, 1913. And Doyle being a physician, you know, and the um, plague identif you know, identified in a British colony, Hong Kong, I think he would have really known about plague and it would have been very contemporary at that time. And I and that's why we think that um, he was probably thinking about plague, even though he didn't actually mention it. And and just just as a side note, uh, plague is present in the US as well, uh, especially the four corner states, right? Colorado, uh, Utah, um, Arizona, and New Mexico, especially New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, there's probably a handful of cases of plague throughout the years, um, each, each year in, in these four corner states, probably like 20 to 30. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a young child uh, who, I don't know how she contracted plague, but she was at Children's Hospital uh, here in Denver, and they couldn't find out what she had. And finally, they came up with the answer of plague. And sure enough, she did have plague. So, so it can happen. You know, it's it's yeah. it's contracted by exposure to um, to mammals that carry plague, like rock squirrels and various organisms, especially if they're dying, and 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 rats as well, obviously. I got one more, and it's probably a takeaway for some bright person who has access to this kind of information, is rather height as the place where Holmes contracted it. In London, specific uh, wharfs were for specific areas for shipping. East India, West India, Canary Wharf or the Canary Islands. So I wonder if Rotherhite was one that was associated with the Orient or Asia. Good question. Yeah. I think if I had done as good as research as Eric, I would have been able to tell you that. <laughs> That's a great. I, I I have to I have to uh, concur with your uh, colleague who was uh, 
singing your praises. Great, great paper. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a quick All right, one. But, well, hold on, Larry. Actually, oh, Lee has her hand up. I'd like oh, I'm to... sorry. <laughs> Go for it, Lee. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask Dr. Ed, um, do you think it's uh, the story is believable? I mean, do you think that Dr. Watson uh, was so gullible that he wouldn't um, uh, he wouldn't um, see through Holmes um, feigning his illness? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Holmes actually mentioned that at, at the end when he, you know, everything was revealed. He says that, you know, because remember, uh, Watson wanted to come closer to him and 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 Holmes said, stand back, you know, it got really angry at him because, because I, and I think Holmes at the end says, you know, I, of course, I respect your acumen because if you would have come closer, you would have detected that I wasn't, you know, if you have felt my pulse or whatever, you would have realized I wasn't really that sick. So I think he was just sort of belittling Watson and did not want him to come near him because, you know, he really, uh, Watson would have figured that out. And, you know, just as a side, um, you know, you know, I mean, we were thinking like, well, you, you know, plague is so contagious. Like, why didn't um, Culverton Smith get sick with it? We know that um, there are people who are just naturally resistant to plague, just like any other diseases, right? So if you look at a household in the Middle Ages, like one in four, really, even though they're around people who are really quite sick with plague, they never get sick with plague. And there's diseases like tuberculosis, we know that as well. You know, you get exposed to someone with tuberculosis, you live with them, but you never come down with, with tuberculosis because of your immune system. And our hypothesis is that Culverton Smith had natural immunity to tuberculosis. Well, thank you. And also, I would just like to add that um, this is not one of my favorite stories because Sherlock Holmes insults Watson four or five times in the story. And, uh, you know, um, I identify with Dr. Watson. And so I just, you know, that, that just rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> Larry, you had a quick question? Well, just just that uh, you, know, you said that because the plague was so deadly, it became known as a catastrophe. But surely the, the 10 plagues in the Bible, which was not oh. clearly not that thing, must have predated it. So I think plagues are probably probably meant disaster, you know, way before yeah. It was medic. It was a medical version of the plague. That that that's my only comment. And yeah, to Lee, right. I'll just say it was part of the act. Lee, you had to do that to keep him away. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But I just wonder whether the original translation from the Bible, whatever language it was, like Latin, right. whatever, was it was it plague? You know, or did they did they? Right, that's that? true. A lot, a lot of that can be inaccurate. Yeah, yeah. That's the case. Yeah, that's a good a point, though. Translated from Hebrew. Yeah. All right. I'll ask my rabbi next time. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ed. So another virtual round of applause for Ed. Um, clearly, when I set up this meeting, I did not pay. I, 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 my timing was a little off, but um, we're probably going to go for another, I would guess, 25 minutes or a half hour just to let everyone know if you cannot keep on. I understand. But I do want to give Larry a chance um, to talk. And then we have a little presentation from uh, Jim Hawkins to wrap things up. So um, let me just introduce Larry here, okay? Because he is a very prominent member of Dr. Watson's Neglected Patients, and he was a former staff surgeon, which is kind of like our vice president. He's a lifelong leader and collector of writings about Sherlock Holmes and his world. He is a retired teacher who's been a member of Dr. Watson's since 1989. Uh, and since 1990, he has attended and organized the toasts for the annual dinners. He also published and edited the club newsletter, the Me Medical Bulletin, for about 10 years in the 1990s. Um, and about 13 years ago, he, uh, with his friend, the late Ronald Lees, which we'll hear about at the end a little bit, uh, founded and continued to run the Outpatients, a group of Dr. Watson's members who meet monthly to discuss the Sherlock Holmes canon, 
and related scholarship. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to Larry. And let me just get the view going here and then you will have the floor, my friend. Okay. Well, all I've got is a talk, just me, no slides. I will hold up a book at one point, but that's it. So, but uh, and I'll, and I'll try to talk as precise as I can. I may do some reading from, uh, from you know, since I've pre-written the talk uh, to some extent, but some of it I can just tell you. It, it's, uh, you know, the thing that, you know, Derek's research on me was very, very accurate, but uh, on my background, but the, uh, the thing he left out is that I did exist before 1989. I, I grew up, I lived and grew up in uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. And, uh, it, and I want to mention that because in, in the context of this talk, it, it has some significance because in, uh, In 19, well, in, in the mid-1980s, I went to a, to a John Bennett Shaw uh, workshop in New Jersey, where I met two guys who, uh, I, who I miss very much now. Uh, uh, their, their names were uh, Tom Utek and Peter Krupe, who later became BSI themselves. And uh, the three of us met and we said, hey, we're from, we live in Brooklyn. Let's start a Brooklyn Science Society. I think it was Tom's suggestion, actually. And... Uh, and so we started a club called the Montague Street Lodges of Brooklyn. And from 80, 1985 and in 1989, though, I, I had to leave since I had for various reasons. It was in the cards for me to move to Denver. And uh, that's when I joined Dr. Watts' Neglected Patients, which I've participated in ever since. So the reason I mentioned Brooklyn is why that's important is because um, the, the, the thing, of, the, the title of my, of my paper is Amelia Luca Brooklyn, from Brooklyn with love. And the, the, the reason why I've always been interested in the red circle, you know, this is a talk about the red circle. And, uh, and the reason I've always been interested in it is because it's the one story in the canon that mentions my hometown, Brooklyn. Uh, there's no other story in the canon where that is mentioned. Plus it features a person who is actually documented in the canon as having lived in Brooklyn. So there's that, and that's Amelia Luca. And that's why she 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 continues to uh, fascinate me. And so uh, I'm gonna do a quick a quick talk on that. And uh, it's about a certain about a little theory I have about the story. Um though, you know, for and I know everybody here has read the story and may probably many, many times, some of you. Uh maybe it hasn't gotten to it yet, though. I don't know. So <laughs> And says yes, a red bull again. Yeah, just joking. In. Anyway, um, the the uh, uh, I, I want to just quick kind of go over some of the details of the story and the plot, so that could, because they're they're all they're all germane to my to my theory. Um, for those of you who uh, uh, you, most of you probably remember that Mrs. Warren was a landlady in a house, and she uh, had a very mysterious lodger. Who she's been, she swore never to speak to or to look at, and uh, she just left here. She just left the lodger uh, a meal, and the, and, the, and then she'd take the tr uh, by the door. She'd leave. They take it in. They take it out, and she'd take the tray, and there'd be like a one-word message on it that communicates something that she needed to know or that she needed. And uh, she, so she and after a long time of her never ever seeing this person, it drove her crazy. And uh, she went to talk to Sherlock Holmes after to look into it, which he said he would. And uh, so through some observations and some clever deductions uh, uh, and, some, and, a, and a clever stratagem, I was gonna say, Holmes deduces that the lodger is not the bearded gentleman with the foreign accent who first arranges the room for the lodger, but actually an attractive dark haired woman who speaks little English. Uh, Holmes further uncovers that the woman is receiving cryptic messages through the agony column of the Daily Gazette. And those messages are signed by some person who signs his initial G. Don't we know about him, he signs his initial G. And, uh, and, she, and also from those, they figure out, Holmes figures out that they, uh, that she's gonna re be receiving a message uh, 
from a, a candle lit across from a, an apartment across the street by way of a candle flash in a window. And uh, when he does get to decode the message and observe it and decode it, Holmes finds out that it's uh, that's actually been written in Italian and speaks of imminent danger to the lodger. So soon, so you know the, the investigation proceeds, and uh, after he after he translates this message, um, we run into Inspector Gregson and an American Pinkerton detective named Leverton of the Long Island cave mystery fame, and. Uh, the uh, the American Leverton and and he uh, so they both the four of them join forces because uh, it turns out that that Greg that uh, Gregson's working on, they've been working on the case from another angle from another perspective and so the four of them uh, compare notes and together they get together and they end up discovering a body of a man who turns out to be uh, Giuseppe Gorgiano of the Red Circle and the Red Circle of course is a mafia like criminal or organization and uh and and so Holmes uses the, the, the candle code to summon Amelia to the place that they they found the body and she comes and and uh and they all retire to back to Mrs. Warren's place and discuss the story there in difficult broken English smooth out by Watson so the readers so it's English-speaking readers can can translate it easily uh, you know it's hard to read that kind of stuff sometimes if you've read Withering Heights or or uh, uh, Huckleberry Finn, it's difficult. So he's nice of Watson to just smooth it out for us. But uh, that uh, she, so she tells a story where uh, about her link between Killer Gorgiano and her, and with her husband Gennaro, Gennaro Luca, who according to Amelia must surely have killed him. You know that must be the answer. He surely must have killed him. And uh, the two left Italy years ago and uh, live in America. But he, he, if he killed him, he did it and then he fled. We don't get to see him. Um, anyway, the, the couple were, were, were fled, fled Italy and got married and, 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 and moved into, went to America and lived in Brooklyn. And, and there uh, they came in conflict with, with uh, this, this murderous Gorgiano and uh, over love and jealousy and loyalty to a friend. And, and so eventually... They just had, they, they felt they had to flee him uh, without getting too caught up in the details. And so they fled to London. And here, uh, the, the Giorgiano and Giorgiano representing the Red Circle uh, caught up with them at last. And her husband, Gennaro, uh, killed him in self defense and fled the scene, supposedly. That's, that's, her, that's her theory. That's her idea of the case. And one of the reasons the story, the Red, now one of the reasons the story of the Red Circle, uh, has become the subject of commentary is that it's uh, is the substitution code, which has lots of problems in it. Uh, the first of which is that it's so unwieldy. If you ever, if, if you know, having to, I mean, it would take hundreds and hundreds of flashes for her to have typed out uh, uh, to, to, to send the message as it's described in the story, which were, uh, and but the candle code was one flash for A, two flashes for B. Etc. cetera, very simple code. And uh, when Holmes decodes it, he discovers that the words attenta and pericolo, which means beware and danger in Italian. Now, uh, so, you know, again, a very cumbersome code. If you ever seen any adaption of this story, either the radio version, the BBC radio version, or the Jeremy Brett version, they always simplify the code because it would have taken hundreds of flashes for her to, to, to say attenta, you know, three, four or five times, and then pericolo uh, would have been just very unwieldy. But um, putting that aside, though, for a moment, uh, the thing that always bothered me about the, the story was what I read in this book. Here's my one, my one visual for you. 221B, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's by Vincent, edited by Vincent Starrett in 1940. And uh, it's it's truly one of the classic classic seminal works of Sherlock Holmes scholarship, but and and but and but if you have if you want to check me and you haven't got that book because that book is hard to find and probably very expensive uh, these days, uh, you would uh, it, it is this is explained what I'm about to explain to you is explained in both annotated Sherlock Holmes 
both the Baringold and the Klinger. So you can look it up and see what I'm talking about. But there's a but according to Starrett wrote in his introduction, uh, which he calls explanation for some reason, but it's it really an introduction. In his introduction, um, he talked about his friend, Professor Lewis E. Lord, who was at one time uh, in the classics department of Oberlin College. And Professor Lord tells uh, tells Starrett that the thing about the word, about the Italian language, that kind of would be, throws off this story a little, is that, um, let's see, I'm gonna quote him exactly. He says, uh, well, I can't find it. Oh, well, he, he says pretty much, she quoted, I think I can remember the quote. He says that there is no letter K in the Italian alphabet. There's no letter K in Italian. So um, it, it, it really bothered him that, uh, first of all, that would have that would have thrown, if K is taken out of the alphabet, that would have thrown the whole code off. I mean, all the T's in Atenta would be used. You know, it just doesn't make sense. It moves over to the next letter, right? The 20th letter after 20 flashes. So, so you know, how, why would two Italian people, he could not figure out, and Starrett concurred on this, why would two Italian people who are using a code to communicate in Italian do it with an Amer not use an Italian alphabet, but use an English alphabet? You know, what, what, how could that be? Why would, why would that happen? And uh, so that was, that's one of the, the big questions is a lot of scholars have, have turned their attention to it and commented on it. Uh, Dakin thought, well, you know, there must be an international language, an international alphabet among European, the European countries. And uh, Donald Yates said that, uh, oh, maybe he needed a K. Maybe Gennaro thought he might need a K in case for, for an English street name or something. He was want to send that across in the code. That was another, another theory about it. But um, I have another theory. And, you know, again, you know, again, the question was, why would two native speaking Italians use an English alphabet to communicate to each other in Italian? Just, you know, it makes no sense. So uh, it is long been my suspicion that the real reason for the use of an English alphabet might possibly indicate something else. Something going on in the story that Watson fails to record. Uh, uh, what can that something be? Well, as, as you know, playing the game, we use the Sherlockian, Sherlock Holmes's methods to try to decode and answer these questions. And so I, I attempted, I attempt to do that now before you. And, and, I've, and, I've, and, I've, and I did this a while back. I thought this through and have thought about it ever since. And I'm excited that I get to tell you about it. Um, so let's see. Uh, the, at least, anyway, the whole thing about the code, if, if uh, let's see. All right. So, in other words, if, if we if we start with 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 Starrett and that's it, if we start with Lord with with Lord and Starrett's assumption that no two people whose first language is Italian would use an English alphabet to structure their code. In other words, eliminate the impossible. What we must conclude, however improbable it may seem, that either the sender or the receiver of this message was not Italian by birth. Uh, now this leads to a inevitable conclusion that Mrs. Luca's whole account at the end may not be all, may not be true, or or parts of it might not be, certainly not altogether true. Um, it, 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 it follows then that her entire story is in question, and this is significant because her story is the source of almost everything we know about the background of this story, and most importantly, what happened in the murder room. So was it the sender or the receiver of the message or both that were not Italian? It seems unlikely that it was both. Otherwise, why use Italian in the first place? If neither of them's, neither of them's first language was Italian. Um, so, uh, and, and, and Holmes had, now Holmes had, so it was either, so it was either one or the other. So which one was it? Well, it probably wasn't Emilia Luca because we know Watson, Holmes deduces but he doesn't really know it when he decodes the message yet. He deduces that her first language is not English, whoever she is, because she sends her little one word messages 
to Mrs. Warren were things like match for matches and gazette for the daily gazette. And so he deduces from that that this woman doesn't speak English. This is not an English speaking lady. And so at least not very well. And so uh, therefore, uh, and, and of course Watson hears her entire story, which of course he he he, he, he makes it easy for us, for, us, for us to read it. But for him, it was hard. He was listening hard. And he, and he was pretty convinced that, or had no reason to, not to suspect, to suspect that she wasn't a true, an Italian woman talking to him in broken English. And so we have to Watson's testimony on that. So it seems like there's a plethora of evidence, at least, that Emilia Luca was a true son, daughter of Italy, a true daughter of Italy. Uh, and so if it wasn't her, it must have been the sender. So there is something about Gennaro Luca and her story about Gennaro Luca that's not right. And um, you know, either, you know, either it wasn't him at all, or it was him, but he wasn't really Italian, or something like that. Something, something there is wrong. And uh, so, um, so we can, so we, so again, for process of elimination, uh, we know it was him. So anyway, uh, so where does that leave us? Well, the sender was not Germain, was not Gennaro Luca, was not the Gennaro Luca, at least not the one he de she describes to us. Then who was he? Was Amelia one story one? And if Amelia's story is in doubt, um, if it is in doubt, De Niro's whole participation in the case uh, becomes in question. This possibility that it was someone other than her Italian husband who was the messenger gains probability when we remember that Watson never actually sees Gennaro Luca. He never actually appears in person in the story. So um, we truly only have Emilio Luca's word that he exists at all. Uh, of course, one would think that if it was a complete fabrication that maybe Gregson or Leverton, who are also investigating the case from another, from another angle, might have tumbled to the fact, but he, she, he, they never questioned it either. So um, at least not in front of Watson. So if, uh, again, it wasn't Gennaro Luca, who was it? Well, whoever he was, well, you know, Watson would say, I don't know, how could we ever know? And Holmes would say, well, it's not as bad as all that, Watson. There are a few assumptions we can make about this person uh, that, uh, you know, that, 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 might, that might tell us. First of all, whoever, um, whoever he was, his first language was not Italian. Because that's how we know it's not it's not Gennaro Luca because his first language is not Italian. Second, Mrs. Warren describes him as being a well dressed man in a beard with a foreign accent. So we know that much about him, uh, at least from Mrs. Warren's point of view. That's what she thought anyway. Second, um, thirdly, from his message in the cassette, we know that his first initial was G. That's the one thing we know about him. So who else involved in this case? Might that description fit? Well, I believe there is only one explanation that covers these facts. Gregson, it was Gregson who's, who, uh, Gregson and Leverton conspired with Fair Amelia for the righteous execution of the killer, Black Giordano uh, of the Red Circle. Now, see how that makes everything fall into place. It was Gregson whose telltale first initial was attached to the agony column ads in the Gazette. It was Leverton in a false beard who rented the room whose American accent struck Mrs. Warren as foreign sounding. It was the two men who signaled Amelia with their code based on the standard English alphabet, perhaps providing her with an alphabet board with numbers next to each letter, uh, you, know, you know, to help her out a little bit. Because it's, again, it was a cumbersome code, counting all those dots and then, and then counting the letters of the alphabet must have been tough, must have been tough. But, uh, Anyway, uh, the code to honor of the danger, a giant in size and 50 times a murderer, the story calls him, and, and kill him with his own knife. I mean, it must have taken at least two people to do that. There's no way it could have been Gennaro Luca, who is an ordinary, described as an ordinary uh, sized person. Um, 
imagine Gregson and everyone's surprised though when they when they left the scene and who did they find but Sherlock Holmes and Watson rushing across the street on the way to the murder room. Oh my goodness, they must have plotted, right? So they must have, so what else could they do but stop them and say, well, you know, let's compare notes. Let's, let's, well, you know, what is it you, you know, so you tell me what you know about the case and I'll tell you what I know about the case. And so, um, you know, this was, this was obviously a, a ploy to uh, get, you know, to stop, to, to get Holmes to, uh, uh, to find out what Holmes knew about it. Um, now, later in the murder room, uh, summoned by Holmes, when Amelia walks in, can you recall her first words? She says, you killed him to her co-conspirators. And uh, then she looks around and realizes that Holmes and Watson is there. She goes, or maybe it was my husband. I don't know. You know, so it's, it's like, it's, it's, very, it's, all very, it's all very suspicious. And uh, they all, when they all go to the Mrs. Warrens and she tells them the story, um, I know, you know, it was clear that, uh, um, you know, so, so th this is, this is the, 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 the crux of my theory. Another interesting uh, field of speculation is Holmes is did Holmes know the truth? Uh, we just, I just, in my science society, we just read the Mazarin Stone, where Billy, where Billy the Page says, uh, Mr. Holmes always know, all, always knows all there is to know. So I, I, I kind of want to think that Holmes kind of knew what was, you know, even if Watson didn't, that doesn't bother me. But if, but if Holmes didn't know, um, well, you know, when Holmes first greets Gregson, what does he say? He, 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 he misquotes Shakespeare. And he says, um, Gregson, journeys end in lovers' meeting. Which makes me wonder if maybe he, he, he knew that there was some kind of romantic relationship going on between Leverton and one of the men, probably Leverton, my guess would be, uh, and, and, and Amelia Luca. Um, they know that she came, he came all the way over from, to, from, from America to try to save her and, and to help her and support her. From, from afar. Um, so, and we know from cases like the Boscombe Valley mystery and uh, the Abbey Grange that Holmes didn't care so much about the letter of the law. He cared about justice and what was right. And, and so, he, so it, it makes perfect sense for him, for his friend, him, for his friend Gregson, that he would maybe go along with fooling Watson and Watson's readers. Uh, he want to get his friend Gregson into big trouble here. So, uh, it makes sense that he would have gone along with the lie, I think. So that's it. That's my that's my theory. And uh, I hope I've at least convinced you that there's more to eat meets the eye in the canonical story, The Adventure of the Red Circle. Thank you. <laughs> Any a question or comment? All right, a virtual Thank round you. of applause for Larry. Thank you so much, Larry. No problem, no problem. Always fun. We can maybe take one comment just because oh, see, uh, we have we have one person who uh, raised their hand, and that was Sandy. And Sandy, you're, you're muted still. Oh, so, uh, yeah, Sandy, you're muted. Let me see if I can unmute you on my end. Okay. Oh, there you go. Excellent. Uh, I loved what you said. But I have another very, very fast one. <laughs> in short, Holmes knew, among other things, Italian. He did pretend to be an Italian priest, remember. And right. so he could translate it from the Italian. What? Right. He had no idea about the Italian al alphabet. So he assumed it was the same as the, the English, and he wrote it out the way he wrote it out in the book. Right. Because he didn't know any better. Right. That's he the end didn't of my know theory. Started decoding it that it was Italian. He turned but, out but, to be Italian. But Watson didn't decode it. Yeah, uh -huh. Holmes decoded yeah, it. That's right. That was Holmes. He knew Italian. That's right. That was Holmes. But, but when yeah. Watson wrote up the story, he had no idea that that uh, how it how Holmes could do it. He just wrote down that Holmes could do it. No, he he said that he counted the flashes, and he said that he you know he, he right, counted just, the that makes alphabet. Sense to him, even though. Even though right. it wasn't exactly so, because he was counting the Holmes was counting the flashes in Italian, right. but Watson didn't realize that it was in Italian. He assumed it was English. Well, he Sandy, there's, he there's no such thing as Italian flashes. <laughs> it's only an Italian alphabet. 
So the thing is, is that Holmes was decoding it, and he didn't know what it wouldn't be an English alphabet. I and love so you he, talk anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 because we are so far over time, right. we're gonna have to, to wrap it. But I do want to give our last presentation, which is only six minutes long, um, and it is by Jim Hawkins, um, who many of you might know in the Sherlockian world for his work uh, preserving the memory of the great John Bennett Shaw. Um, through the website johnbennettshaw.com and the Facebook page, The Friends of John Bennett Shaw. Both Shaw and Hawkins have the same BSI title, uh, The Hans Sloan of My Age. And one of our dearly departed members, Ron Lees and Jim, formed a science society around Shaw called the Brother Shaw. Jim couldn't be with us today in person because he's with his family celebrating his 80th birthday, which is tomorrow. Uh, he did provide us with a recorded, a short recorded presentation um, on Ron, his brother and Shaw. Um, they were together from 2010 to 2023. So just give me one second to queue it up and this will kind of wrap up our presentation for today. If I can find it, <laughs> hold on a second. Uh, here we go. Give me one second because I know that's not what I want to show you. And one second. Well, one sec. I got. I'm actually going to stop sharing for a second here to pull it up. There it is. My apologies on that. Now I will share correctly this time. Okay. Here we are. And people bring me I go back with a suitcase full of stuff I collect anything homes good or bad indifferent vulgar obscene anything religious I have a manuscript that compares homes to Christ favorably
All right, a virtual round of applause for Jim. And I just wanna thank you all again uh, for joining us this afternoon. I guess some places in the world is turning into, it's now evening. Um, but thank you for spending time or for our 50th anniversary. And here's to 50 more. Thank you um, and have a great rest of your day. So thank you so much for participants and especially those of you who made it to the end here. Take care, everyone. Bye now.